I'm going to be focusing my sermon on Genesis. If you guys want to follow along, there's a lot going on in there, and I want to unpack it a bit. Um, so if you know me, uh, you'll find out that I love to cook. Like, I find it very, very relaxing. Um, I go home from work, and I start chopping. I start doing the vegetables. I start chopping up the meat, whatever we're doing, and I start cooking. Um, it's just something that I love to do. Um, I love the meditative part of it where I'm not thinking about anything but the thing I'm chopping in front of me and what I'm doing. I like the creative aspects of it. I like um, seasonings and spices and all of that that goes into it. I like the history. I like to be like, where does this food come from? What is it about? Who may, came up with this? Um, I like the hospitality. I like the sharing. I love to eat with people. I love to see people eat what I make. Um, I, I love all that. The one thing that I don't love is the patience. Um, I struggle to wait. Um, if there's a weakness in what I do, it's that I will pull that food out before it's ready. Um, there's something about the patience, about waiting, right? That, that's just challenging. You're waiting for meat to soften, right? Or, or whatever the reward of the work is. You want that reward now. Um, but when you wait, and it turns out, there's a joy that not just in that, but there's a joy as you look back over what you've been doing. And there is a joy, I think, to the things that we have to wait for. There's a joy in the things that we take care to do. The things that we have done bits and pieces of over time. See what bears fruit. Um, another thing I could think about that is very relevant to me and probably what relevant to the passage is there's a joy. Um, and there's a struggle and there's a struggle with waiting, but there's a joy in childbirth, right? There's a joy in having a baby um, or three. Um, <laughs> there is a, uh, a joy in that, even when you only sleep, sleep three hours that night or last night. Um, and um, Abraham and Sarah were in the desert, faithfully following God all of their lives. Since God called Abraham many years ago. And he promised them, promised them that their offspring would be as many as the stars in the sky. <clears throat> and then nothing happened. I mean, nothing happened for all of the time that you would be able to have children. Nothing happened. Nothing happened so much that Abraham and Sarah got impatient and he slept with a servant girl to create, maybe, maybe, maybe we're going to go sideways with this, to create the lineage uh, that was promised to them. There's a, a, a pain in that empty place, right? Right? There's a pain in the empty womb. There's a, a, um, a doubt that creeps in. There is a struggle um, and a dark shadow that comes upon it. And then there's a point when you get to and you kind of forget the promises and you live your life. And that is the point where God comes 
to Sarah and Abraham. Can we bring up the picture? Um, we'll get to this in a second. Um, I'm going to use it as bait. And just like, when is he going to talk about it? Um, but that is the point when the, when the angel is the Lord. Or as, as I understand it, the Lord and the angels comes to Abraham. Now, if you were the people of Israel and you were wandering the wilderness looking for the promise, waiting to enter the promised land, if you were the people of Israel and you were captured in slavery for 400 years, if you were the people of Israel and you've been taken into exile for decade upon decade, and if you were the people of Israel and you have been conquered by the Roman Empire, first the Greek Empire, then the Roman Empire, for centuries. And you're waiting for the promised land, for deliverance, for the Messiah. This message is really, really important. Wait on the Lord. He is true to his promises. Wait on the Lord. He puts life in the barren land. In the barren womb. In the people in slavery who he delivers out. In the people in the wilderness who he brings into the promised land. In the conquered people in Rome who he brings Jesus the Messiah to. Wait on the Lord. For he has come, he has fulfilled his promises, and he is coming again, and he will fulfill his promises. The power of the message of the waiting, the power of the message of the fulfillment of the waiting. And this meeting is fascinating to me. I mean, everything implies to me that that is God in human, as a, in human form. Human form is the only form on this earth that God would take. Because it is the only form that bears the image of God in creation. He's not a donkey. He's not an ox. He's not any of the, these images of creation. As man, he comes and he sits at the table of Abraham. And, they, and Abraham enters into this act of hospitality with him. It is extreme hospitality. He is loading up the bread. He is slaughtering the fatted calf. He is giving all that he has, all the riches of his land, in a way, as quickly as possible and setting it at their table. Hospitality is central to definitely Middle Eastern relationships, but I think uh, I have friends in Africa who would talk about this too. If you go to Africa um, and you go to someone, you visit someone's home and they own one chicken, they will kill that chicken for you and give it to you. And the reason is that, that hospitality, having a meal with somebody, hosting somebody, is so central to, to who we are and how we bear God's image. And so he gives him the food, and Jesus, with the angels, sits at the table. Now this painting... There's a Rublev um, icon. is about those angels sitting at the table of Abraham. But if you see how it's set, they're kind of all face turned towards us in a way. And you are invited to sit at the table of God. And in fact, the hospitality that's being practiced is the hospitality of God 
invite us to sit at the table. And what does it mean to sit at the table with God? It means that at this moment, he is meeting you as equal. God is not equal with you. But he is meeting you at your table, in your home, as equal. And he is meeting Abraham as community. Right? Big part of hospitality is how are we community in the world? How are we family? And you're being invited to this picture. If you walk, look, the more you look at it, the more you realize it's kind of like inviting you to sit here. To sit here and eat at this table with God. And in the cup, if you look really closely, is, uh, is the sacrifice. You are invited to the table of God because God has laid down his life for you. And like I said, at the heart of God is hospitality. In the wilderness, the people of Israel were fed manna from heaven. Throughout the narrative of scripture, you see God feeding and caring for his people, giving them this land flowing with milk and honey, giving them of his table, giving them from the garden of God. And in Jesus Christ, we encounter this same kind of hospitality. That God meets us at his table and eats with people like Zacchaeus, known sinner and tax collector, transforming him and the whole community in doing it. The reality is when Jesus sits at the table and eats with sinners, he is saying, we are one. We are community. I see you can you see me? Right? The reason that Abraham doesn't laugh is because he sees. Right? Sarah's behind the tent. She doesn't see. But he sees. And God sees him and he gives them a child. And that Child is direct lineage to the coming of Jesus Christ into this world. This is maybe the central event outside of Jesus for the sake of humanity. And it is in a desert at table fellowship where God comes and meets these people and fills that empty place with the promises and hope of God. And it is hope that we're talking about. All of this points to the reality that we are still waiting. We are still waiting patiently in the midst of the hospitality and blessings and gifts of God and all the good things that he has done for us and all the love he has lavished on us, we are waiting for the fulfillment of all things, the end. When I was a kid, uh, I would say that the church I was in was a bit of a hellfire church. Um, I was scared to death of the end. Scared to death of God. But Revelations doesn't end in disaster. Revelations ends with a party. It ends with the ultimate hospitality, the wedding feast with God. 
Farrar Capon, who was a um, theologian and cook and artist and a million other things, says this. The Bible actually ends with a party. The marriage supper of the Lamb and his bride. The celebration after the stormiest of all courtships. Of the wedding between God and his family recon- is finally reconciled creation. Since the end is always the best place to begin. Look first at the image that speaks directly to the party as an act of faith. The book of Revelation's final picture of the consummation as a sit-down dinner for 10,000 times 10,000. Authors give themselves away in their last chapters of the whole, and the Holy Spirit is no exception. If, for instance, a book ends with corpses, confusion, and tears, we know that the writer's deep, what the writer's deepest belief in, spite of all bright hours he contrived to crowd between his beginning and his end is that life is a mess. If this all ends in disaster, if it ends and Sarah has no child and the promises are not fulfilled, if it ends and Christ does not return, or he only returns to judge and to cast off, then life is a mess, the end. But it ends with the biggest party we can ever imagine, the wedding feast. The first miracle of Jesus is a wedding feast where he turns water into wine. The parables of Jesus that tell us to be ready for the coming kingdom are about bridesmaids carrying lanterns going to the wedding feast. It is a joyous reality that we are looking towards. It is the laughter of Sarah. It is the comfort of God. It is a meal with God. It is wine and food. It is the greatest party ever. And in this life, we have parties. But those parties aren't like this party. Not because those ones are fun and this one will be religious. Um, But quite the opposite. Because at those parties, Susie and Bobby have too much to drink and start to fight. At those parties, Joanne was supposed to bring dip and she did not. And Bill was supposed to not bring the kids and he brought the kids and it's a no kids party. (laughs) Right? In this life, everyone messes things up for each other and we mess it up for ourselves. We have a party and we have foretastes of joy and happiness. Good food, good wine, a good God, good conversation. But there's a brokenness in the midst of it, a a, a irreconciliation between people, a broken relationships. Don't invite them because they don't get along with them. You know how it is. Um, And then someone has to clean up, which is why no one wants to actually host a party. Um... And all of this, all of this in this world. But we hold on with patience with one another, right? Practicing hospitality towards each other's broken hearts and souls. Waiting and believing that at one time we will be at a party with one another that will be perfect and beautiful, and good, and it will be joy, and song, and dancing, don't tell the Baptists, and it will be beautiful. And so let us eat from God's table in his abundance, his graciousness, his hospitality, his bread and wine that he has given us, 
and go into the world and do likewise. Amen.